Somebody asked an old preacher once why he always preaching and talking about the blood. Because there's nothing but the blood that can cleanse you from your sin. It's only through the blood. Amen. Praise God for that. Good singing this morning. We appreciate that so much. Please take your Bible and turn to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Corinthians chapter 15. Paul writing under inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God is writing this epistle letter to the church of Corinth. And if you've done any uh, Bible study at all, you understand that the church of Corinth had uh, lots of difficulties. Every church has lots of difficulties. And it's because churches are made of people. And whenever there's people, there are difficulties. And we're just a bunch of sinners saved by grace. Amen. Sure. Praise God for that. And so he is writing 1 Corinthians, and he's telling them about some problems that they have. 2 Corinthians is after they straighten some things out. But in 1 Corinthians in chapter 15, after they have been uh, uh, dealing with sins within the church and uh, the saints of the church and uh, talking about spiritual gifts within the church, he starts off 1 Corinthians chapter 15 with the word moreover. Moreover than uh, any problem, uh, this is what's most important right here. And so this is an important topic of this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and in verse 1 the Bible says, Moreover brethren I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you which also ye have received and wherein ye stand by which also ye are saved if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that He was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep, or dead at the present writing is what it's talking about. After that, he was seen of James, then all of the apostles. Last of all, he was seen of me also as of one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles that am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach, and so ye believed. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear Lord, this morning that you've allowed us in the house of God. And I ask you that you would forgive me of my sins and fill me with thy spirit. Please help me to be able to preach and teach the Word of God with truth, without heresy. And as your Word goes forth, that it will land on fertile ground and produce fruit in the heart and the life of the one that speaks and those that listen. And dear Lord, if there happens to be one here or next door with the children or that is not saved, please speak to their heart about getting saved today. And for the child of God to be strengthened through the preaching of the Word of God and that you would be glorified and lifted up, praying for the Gospel message wherever it is preached around the world today, that people would be saved. Dear God, we're praying for America in a very special way, for our families, for our people, for this church and churches that are preaching the gospel. Help us now, dear Lord. We are totally dependent upon you because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to notice in this portion of Scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 and 2, the Bible says that this is most important. He says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel of which I have preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand. And so the gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection. 
And that's the good news that is to be preached. And he said he preached that. And then he says that they received it. There is the word received that I want you to see. And then in verse 11, I want you to see the word, and so ye believe. Both had to do with the preaching of the word of God. So uh, he's talking about that he preached unto them in verse 2, and uh, that they received and, and believed. And then he talks about in verse 11 that uh, he preached, or they preached, and uh, they believed. And so it is receiving and uh, believing on the matter of the gospel message for your soul's salvation. There, there's nothing else more important than that. that. That's most important. All kinds of problems, all kinds of difficulties in the family, in your life, in church, uh, in America. But moreover, this is most important. The preaching of the gospel, the good news of death, burial, and resurrection, and the reception thereof, the receiving of it. And uh, when we believe it and receive it and act upon it, then that will take care of most any and all of the other the problems and so forth. Now this is what I want you to, to look at for just a moment. In verse 2, the Bible says, Of this gospel which was preached, it was received, it was believed, and you stand. You, you stand. And so the question could be posed, what do you stand for today? Moreover, you, you, you stand for some rights and wrongs and those types of things, and praise God you have a stand on a certain matter, but where do you stand on the gospel? That's the, the main stance that you need to take. All these other things will take uh, their, their place when you take a stand on the gospel. He says, wherein you stand. He says, verse 2, by which also you're saved. That you have to be saved. That you have to know for sure that when you die, you go to heaven. You're saved. Now watch. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, now notice this phrase, unless you have believed in vain. Believing in vain. <coughs> Believing in vain can look like no change in life or lifestyle since hearing and believing the gospel or at least having a mental assent to the truth without the conviction and the conversion that takes place. It's like the sower and the seed. Four types of soil come to church. And on a, on a given day, one type of soil actually receives that and bears fruit. That's the parable of the sower and the seed. And so an individual can come to church and say, uh, praise God, that's, that, that's truth. Receive that. And I feel good about that. But walk out and the devil takes it away. He encouraged you for a moment, and that's good. But there was no action. On the matter of the gospel and being saved, he's talking about here, unless you believed in vain, Believing in vain is indicated by no change in lifestyle since hearing and making a mental asset to the truth. There's conviction, but there was no true conversion that takes place. There is a difference in the Bible between a backsliding and believing in vain. Backsliding is a child of God that is backing up on God backing away from God. And uh, it that's a saved person that just backs up, backs out, backs away from God, just cools down. Was close to God, but now is not. Believing in vain is an unsaved person. A backslider is a saved person that if they die, they go to heaven. A believing in vain person is a person who has never truly accepted Christ as their Lord and salvation. Savior. 
So this morning, for our brief time together, from this portion of Scripture, I'm going to preach on this thought, and, and I won't be long, uh, evidence of salvation. Evidence of salvation. Salvation is of God. From the heart, from the lips of Jonah, in the belly of the whale, and, and sometimes it takes that kind of whale-like experience for an individual to wake up to this and to cry out to God. You remember the story. In Jonah 2.9, the Bible says, But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. And if you're in the depths of the sea, in the depths of the well, uh, and death is encompassing you, then by the grace of God, you can look up and say, salvation is of the Lord. And, and hopefully it does not take that. But salvation is of God. It's, it's nothing that you do. Salvation is of God. He said in our portion of Scripture that you received and you believed. Salvation is of God. And then I want to say quickly that salvation is by grace. You don't deserve it. You don't earn it. You're not trying to do the best that you can. Salvation is by grace. For by grace are you saved through faith. Ephesians chapter 2 and in verse 8. You're saved by grace through faith. Salvation is of God. Salvation is by grace. It's not what you do, it's what He's done. It's all by grace that you get saved, and it's all by grace that you're kept saved. You can't help God save you. You can't help God keep you saved after you have been saved. It's by grace. And then salvation is a gift. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That means you have to receive it. The Apostle Paul said, We preached the gospel, death, burial, and resurrection. Whereby you saved, you stand, lest you believed in vain. He said you received it, and you believed it. It's a gift. It's available, but you have to receive it. 2 Corinthians 9.15 makes this statement. Thanks be unto God for His unspeakable gift. The gift of salvation is an unspeakable gift. In Romans chapter 3, 24, the Bible says, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Being justified freely. It is a gift. In evidence of salvation, salvation is of God. Salvation is by grace. Salvation is a gift. And any other type of salvation is not biblical salvation. Evidence of salvation. Number one, what does salvation look like in a saved person? Is there evidence? Evidence of salvation. This is biblical salvation. Uh, take your Bible and look at Jeremiah chapter 24 and verse 7. Jeremiah chapter 24, verse 7. Evidence of salvation. Number one, salvation looks like something in a saved person. Number one, it looks like a changed heart. In Jeremiah chapter 24, and in verse 7, a changed heart. In Jeremiah chapter 24 and in verse 7, the Bible says, God speaking, and I will give them an heart to know me, that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God, for they shall return unto me with their whole heart. God says that He's going to give them the heart to know Him. God's going to give them a new heart. God's going to change their heart. In biblical 
salvation, an evidence of salvation, is that you've had a change of heart. Have you had that change of heart? It comes from God. It's not something that you work up to try to say, I'm going to demonstrate this. It comes from God. It was received. It's a gift. It was believed. It's by grace. But it is of God, and He gives you a change of heart. That change of heart is to know Him. I think it was the Apostle Paul that said that I may know Him. And, and not just the mental asset, historical Jesus, but I'm talking spiritual, that He is the Son of God and God the Son. And an evidence of salvation is a change of heart. The change of heart comes from God and it's so that you can know Him. How do I know if I have that? Here's a good question. Do you want to know Him? Is there a change of heart that has made you to where you want to know God? He says, and I will give them a heart to know me. A heart to know God. Do you want to know God? Do you want to know the things of God? Do you have a desire as the heart panteth after the water brooks? He says, I'll be their, their God. Do you have a heart after God that you want God to be your God? Or are you still in control wanting to be your God? I'm just talking about evidence of salvation. Look at Ezekiel chapter 11. This is evidence of salvation. The Apostle Paul said, lest you believe in vain. So I'm talking about evidence of salvation in Ezekiel chapter 11 and in verse 19. The Bible says, Ezekiel 11, 19, and I will give them one heart. This is God speaking to the people. And I will give them one heart. And I will put a new spirit within you. And I will take away the stony heart of, of your flesh. And will give them a heart of flesh. And so the reference here is that God is changing a heart. He's giving them a heart to know Him. He's giving them a heart to be able to receive. You're keeping in mind the parable of the sower and the seed. The parable of the sower and the seed is that the... The ground uh, was only able to receive and grow in one type of soil or the soil of the heart. And if it was too rocky or if it was not tilled up, you, you had to break up the fallow ground type of thing. And God says, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. Through the preaching of the Word of God, you receive it and you believe it and then you act upon it and then God gives the change of heart. That's an evidence of salvation. Notice the same uh, verbiage in Ezekiel 36. And in verse 26, God speaking to His people, He says in Ezekiel 36, 26, A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. He's talking about that I'll give you a new heart, new spirit, Holy Spirit of God. I'll take away that cold, hard, callous heart for the things of God and give you a heart that's able to receive it. That's a changed heart. It's an evidence of salvation. You've had a change of heart on the matter of God and the things of God. You have a heart that wants to know God, to receive the things of God. It's not something you manifest and you work it up, but if there has not been that, then you need to ask the Lord for biblical salvation. In Acts chapter 8 and in verse 37, the Bible says, and I'll read it to you. You remember Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. This is the Ethiopian eunuch asking about water baptism. He wasn't going to grant him water baptism unless he had been saved, born again. And so he asked him about his belief. 
And he answered the Ethiopian eunuch and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And then he suffered or permitted him to be baptized. It was a matter of the heart. In Romans 10, 9 of Romans Road, the Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Here's an evidence of biblical salvation. There's a change of heart. And you could pause and ponder that uh, for the rest of the time. I'll move along quickly, but how's your heart? Do you have a heart for God? Now listen to me a minute. I already prefaced the message. There is a difference between a backslider and one that believed in vain. Believing in vain is a lost person. A backslider just used to be close to God and they're not now. There's a change of heart. A change of heart is evidence of biblical salvation. Moreover, than anything going on in your life right now. That's, that's the most important thing. Moreover than anything going on in America. That's the most important thing. In fact, you can see through the lens of Scripture what's going on when you have that kind of biblical salvation. And you can see in your, your own life a changed heart. Let me say this real quick. If you go to Hebrews chapter 12, evidence of salvation is a changed heart or a change of heart towards God and the things of God. Here's a, another evidence of biblical salvation. It's a chastening hand. Salvation comes from God. It's a changed heart. God changes your heart. When you get saved, God changes your heart. Truly saved. It's an evidence of salvation. A heart to know God. A heart to get back to God. All of that. Number two evidence of biblical salvation is a chastening hand. And a chastening hand is promised from God just like salvation is. In Hebrews chapter 12 and in verse 5. Hebrews 12 verse 5. The Bible says, Paul writing under inspiration of the Spirit of God again says, and ye have forgotten the exhortation. Now, when he says you have forgotten the exhortation, he's digging back into the Old Testament to bring this truth out. It's Old Testament brought into the New. It's the same thing. God's the same with his children. He says, and ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Now watch this, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, where of all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we had fathers of our flesh, which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us with their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening for the present seemed to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yielded the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. There is the chastening hand. This is an evidence of biblical salvation that I am a son of God because God has promised to correct every child of God. There's perfect correction from the child of God. Every son, everyone whom God loves, they receive correction. Nobody is exempt from that. They all receive that. If there is no correction, there, there is evidence that there's no sonship. That there's the correcting hand of God. What's going on? It could be the correcting hand of God trying to get attention. Why is, why is nothing going right? We'll pause and ask. I don't know that it's the chasing hand of God, but it begs an answer. Why? Well, then I better pause and, and, and ask. Chastening can look like different things for different people. 
So you don't have to try to draw attention to it to me or me, you, or to each other. It's personal. It's between you and God. It's between you and God. Now, I was the least of six, and when my brothers got chastening, I laughed. <laughs> And sometimes when you see the, you know, somebody else's kid get spanked or whatever, you're like, yeah, get him. He needs it. <laughs> you got to take it personal. You and I may need it. And God, the perfect Heavenly Father, knows how to give it. And the chastening hand of God starts off with a guiding hand. It, it's a hedge. It's a hedge. You're, 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 you're going the wrong way. You're going the wrong way. And he starts putting the hedge up and you start moving against the hedge. You start breaking out of the hedge. And then he has to be a little bit more persuasive to get you going in the right direction. And then it increases because he's the perfect Heavenly Father. The chastening hand of God. It's an evidence of biblical salvation that you have the chastening hand of God of correction. The psalmist said this in Psalm 119 verse 67. Before I was afflicted I went astray, but now have I kept thy word. Do you ever feel you allow the Holy Spirit of God to speak to your own heart on this. Do you ever feel like you're kind of going astray on God? Was there a time when the gospel was preached, you heard, you believed, you received the word of God, and by the grace of God, burdens are lifted at Calvary, praise God, and you're doing what God wants you to do, and so forth. But somewhere along the way, you start losing that zeal. And you start losing that zeal, and you're looking for a feeling instead of the facts and faith from the word of God, and you kind of quit, you kind of back up and things, and stuff just doesn't go right. You ever feel like, I'm kind of going astray on God, but nobody's perfect. And that type of thing. And pretty soon you're farther and farther and farther away from God. The psalmist said, that was my testimony. He says that. Because the Bible reveals all the truth of man. And, and before I was afflicted, I went astray. I was going astray. But now... Have I kept thy word? That's after the chastening hand of God. In fact, the psalmist says in verse 71 of the same chapter, it was good for me. It was good for me. The chastening hand. The chastening hand of God is an evidence of sonship and salvation. You ever experienced some of that? We can get it for our own foolishness, and I know that. We can get in trouble doing what we shouldn't be doing and get that. That's not necessarily. It's just uh, that's a product of our wrongdoing. But I'm talking about the chastening hand of God for going astray a little bit from God. It's an evidence of salvation. Now here's last. I said that Paul is speaking to them about the difficulties. And there were difficulties, divisions in the church and so forth. And there are now, and there's difficulties, there's division in America, sometimes even in the household. But Paul said, moreover, he said, this is most important. I declare to you the gospel. Uh, would you believe you stand at the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ? He says, unless you believe in vain. And so the message this morning is evidence of salvation. A change of heart. It comes from God when you get saved. Have you had it? There's a time when everybody's lost. They actually have to come to the age of accountability and realize that they are a sinner in need of salvation to get saved and make a conscious choice to get saved. Have you done that? You've had a change of heart towards God. You want to know God. You want to know the things of God. And then along the way, you may have gotten a little bit cold, callous, and indifferent, kind of straying away, and, and God brings some direction. God brings some direction and sometimes correction. It's called the chastening hand of God. Have you felt it? It's out of God's love that He's given that to you to get you back on track. Evidence of salvation is not only a change of heart, chastening hand, but a challenged hindsight. 
and this is where I'll end. A challenge to hindsight, not to turn back. Not to turn back. If you notice this familiar portion of Scripture, Philippians chapter 3, Philippians chapter 3, and in verse 13, a challenged hindsight. Probably as far as persecution goes from a biblical standpoint, you probably would not find a more persecuted Christian than the Apostle Paul. And I'm talking about after he got saved and all that he went through. And it would make uh, most of us, me first, to quit and backslide on God because of all the persecution. And maybe you as well, I don't know what you're going through. But the Apostle Paul certainly went through manifold uh, temptations and persecutions. Now, that would have been a challenge for him to just say, you know what, I'm saved. I already know about eternal security. In fact, I've written on it, preached about it. He had a doctorate degree on eternal security. He could have said, you know what, I'm just going to go back to the old ways. No persecution that way. And if they want to die and go to hell, so be it. But he didn't. Now listen to me because I'm almost done. An evidence of biblical salvation is a changed heart, chastening hand of God when you go astray and a challenged hindsight. The challenged hindsight is saying I can't go back. In Philippians chapter 3 verse 13 the Bible says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Forgetting those things that are behind, all the difficulties, maybe even all the victories type of thing, the difficulties, I'm pressing on the upward way. You, new heights I'm climbing every day. There is a challenged hindsight. It's not better back there. You can't get to be like the Israelites remembering the leeks and the melons back in bondage. And a lot of children of God have made a move towards God and gotten saved. And then they start remembering the leeks and the melons back in bondage. And there's the opportunity to go back. A challenged hindsight. Notice this real quickly. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And in verse 9, changed heart, chastening hand of God, and a challenged hindsight. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9, the Bible says, Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. This is writing in regards to what we talked about in 1 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians is him writing to ensure them that what you did in repentance, that was right, that was good. And then he's saying from the heart, I, I didn't want to make you sorry per se, but that you sorry to repentance. The preaching of the Word of God accomplished what it should. Now watch this. For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent. Though I did repent, verse 8, for I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for reason. That was 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Now, verse 9, I rejoice not that you were made sorry. It wasn't that I wanted to hurt your feelings. And the preacher doesn't want to hurt feelings. But that you sorry to repentance. For you were made sorry after a godly manner that you might receive damage by us in nothing. Verse 10. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Now let me tell you what that, uh, the obvious is there. Godly sorrow 
comes after the preaching of the Word of God, the conviction from the Holy Spirit of God, and then conversion through the Holy Spirit of God, Titus 3, 5, washed, regenerated. Godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. God, I'm a sinner, and I'm sorry for my sins from the heart. And I now confess Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I believe in my heart. God raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. And it's from the heart. Now watch this. He says, not to be repented of. And the phrasing means is that you didn't get saved and number one, you're sorry you got saved. You got true biblical salvation, you ain't sorry you got saved. Amen. You're glad you got saved. Amen. That's what he's talking about. Number two, in the lifestyle, it means I'm not turning back from it. Not to be repented of. I was going this way, my direction with God, and I just got too close to God, got too much involved in the church and godly things and Bible and prayer, so I'm just going to kind of back off on God. He you said, you're heading for trouble. Because you've had a change heart, God gave it to you, now you're about to get the chastening hand. For every son of God receives it. This challenge time side says, I've started off for God, and I'm not turning back. There's nothing good back there. He brought you out of the depths of hell. You're going forward for the cause of Christ and the glory of God. A challenge time side. We'll close with this portion of Scripture. It's in John chapter 6. John chapter 6. In John chapter 6, and in verse 66, Six 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 is not a good number, five. <laughs> From that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. And that's not a good statement about people. But it does happen. An evidence of salvation. Changed heart, chastening hand and a challenge to hindsight. Now watch this as we finish. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. If you would read the before and after, it's because they got too deep. It's got too deep. Now watch. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? Are you going to turn back now? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And so the question has to be posed to you this morning. Where else are you going to go? To whom are you going to go? If you think you got things figured out, you're wrong. Only God's got it figured out. You better get as close to Him as you can. You better draw an eye to God. There's no place else to go. There is no turning back. They tested a man for COVID, came back negative. He didn't have it. If you had COVID, would you want to know? If you had COVID, would others want to know? They tested him for cancer, came back negative. If you had cancer, uh, would you want to know? Would others want to know? He was tested for salvation and it came back negative. In accordance with Scripture. If you were saved, would you want to know? If you were saved, would others want to know? There is biblical evidence of salvation. You want to know, you need to know, you have to know before you leave this earth. And others want to know it as well. What is evidence of true biblical salvation? Changed heart comes from God.
chastening hand. That also comes from God. And it challenged hindsight. I'm not turning back on God. Those are evidence of biblical salvation. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear Lord, for the Word of God. Thank you for the Holy Spirit of God that has to take it and make it real. We can't. Praying now, dear Lord, that the Holy Spirit of God will take the preached Word of God and make it real to somebody's heart. Maybe for biblical salvation that's not saved, but for encouragement for all those who are. And I say, by the grace of God, I'm not going to turn back now. I've gone too far. And dear Lord, there is nobody else to turn to. You are the way, the truth, and life. You are the answer to all things. Help us now, dear God, to realize that act upon it. And dear Lord, if somebody needs to make any kind of decision during the invitations, we, Holy Spirit of God, give them the liberty to do that. We ask it in Jesus' name.